Welcome to Catalytic Curiosity. I am your host, James with a Y O'Farron with Catalytic Conversations. I serve remote professionals and hybrid organizations with co coaching, consulting, and training to help them reconcile humanity and technology, leading to healthier, digitally integrated lives and teams. On this podcast, I am embarking on a journey of discovery to unearth the roots of digital mastery and maturity beyond mere adulting. I interview insightful and intriguing experts exploring how we can develop sage-like maturity with intention in today's digitized world. Today's episode brings Stephen Dunkel to the table to talk about generations and connecting. Stephen recently accepted the position of executive pastor of youth ministry at Hope Lutheran Church. This role oversees all teams ministering to cradle through college at Hope's three campuses, serving over a thousand students. Stephen graduated from Wheaton College with master's degrees in biblical exegesis, historical and systematic theology, and a bachelor's degree in ancient language and biblical and theological studies. He and his wife Sarah have a cat named Ellie, and in their spare time they love traveling to new places and playing duets on guitar and violin. During our conversation, we talked about generation gaps and communication gaps because of engagement in different kinds of social media and how to stay connected in large communities and large teams uh, using his experience and insights from scripture and his experience in ministry. I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope that you get a lot out of it as we explore ways to bridge differences online. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Catalytic Curiosity. Today with me is Stephen Dunkel, a good, another good friend of mine from Fargo that I met here uh, when he visited uh, my church. And he actually recently accepted a position as executive pastor at another church, at a Lutheran church here um, locally in town. And so he's had a lot of experience there. And we've talked a lot in the past about all kinds of things. We just tend to talk about all kinds of different stuff and keep on going. So we'll hopefully keep this conversation <laughs> within a regular episode length. Uh, but uh, we wanted to discuss a little bit about some of the things that we've both learned together about generations and generation gaps and things like that in this particular episode. So Stephen, uh, tell me a bit about yourself, You know where you come from and all this, how you got into the kind of ministry that you do, what interests you, about uh, working with the kinds of people that you work with. Absolutely. As a middle schooler and high schooler uh, back in the day, I felt that I knew a lot about God as much as a middle schooler or high schooler could. I'd gone to church, I'd read the verses, I'd sung the songs, but I felt that I didn't know God personally. Mm -hmm. And through relationships and uh, mentors in my local church. Um, I came to become a Christian and later become a Christian pastor. And um, in that arc, um, I grew a lot in, in my confidence, in um, my understanding of vocation and who I am. Mm -hmm. And one of the I things I found, issues. yeah, as I began studying ministry for my undergrad and then for two master's degrees is that most um, Christians, their story is that they became a Christian in what's called that critical decade. National Association of Evangelicals says that 63% of Christians become so between the ages of four and 14. And there's something about this window of time as we get into middle school as we get into high schooler schoolers event developmentally we're asking these questions mm -hmm. of who am I what is my purpose why am I here and so what I found is that in ministries some of my most fruitful and impactful ministry as a Christian pastor has been with students mm -hmm. and so coming out of grad school I accepted a position as a pastor back here in Fargo and um, eventually uh, became the youth pastor at Bethel Church, um, which um, I met you. The, yeah, <laughs> <Sort> over <laughs> middle schoolers and high schoolers. That's where I'm sitting now. And uh, it's just this, um, just this massive influx of young people coming in, asking these questions about identity and vocation and um, who God is, um, and how they fit within this world that he's created. 
And so with that, there have been a number of unique opportunities and unique challenges. When I came to faith um, as a middle schooler, my experience is very different, was very different than middle schoolers today. True. It's very different, um, you know, even than middle schoolers today have different experience than they had, you know, five or 10 years ago and, and pre-COVID and all of these things. And so I came in as a millennial who had the mission field of reaching Generation Z. And now the incoming middle schoolers are no longer Generation Z, but they're Generation Alpha. Which, which so, for this episode, I had been wondering what people were going to call the next generation because we've run out of letters. And so you show me this book, I was like, ah, of course, they're going to loop back to the beginning. <laughs> that brings you under the sun. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, let's go. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So what are some, as, you, as you've worked with, um, you know, different people throughout different generations, like in the same cohort, but as generations have moved through, but also trying to bridge them, bridge the gap between yourself and them, but then also helping them to connect to people. Cause like, that's one of the things that, so I was homeschooled and I lived in a, you know, large family. I was oldest of eight. And so we didn't really have age segregation in my experience growing up. We didn't really do intramural sports where you play with a field of kids all exactly the same age. Uh, it was always family with family with family, like homeschool co-op type things. Mm -hmm. So I got very familiar with dealing with, you know, people who were much younger than me and much older than me. And I actually didn't practice a whole lot dealing with people who were my own age. Most people who were mm -hmm. my own age had different interests than I did and I didn't really connect with them very well. So yeah. that became an asset that I actually became really good at bridging generation gaps. That was mm -hmm. a skill that I developed. And it's super powerful when you can help somebody who's young learn from someone who's old and someone who's old learn from someone who's young. Absolutely. I think it's become hugely important nowadays too with how, like you mentioned, like before COVID, after COVID, it's almost its own generation. <laughs> like a huge epoch changing event that's changed how we do so many things has created a generational gap almost for people. Mm -hmm. So how do, like, this is happening more and more, these different huge fundamental changes, people becoming digital natives, growing up with virtual reality <laughs> from birth is, that's gonna be so weird. <laughs> what, is, what have you learned to help? What are some of the distinctions, what are the distinctives that you've noticed of differences between these generation gaps? And what have you learned for helping bridge those gaps though, in, in your experience? Absolutely. For millennials, yes. one of the patterns of student ministry was these, you know, big flashy events. You'd bring in this band and get a thousand people together and some evangelists would come up and, um, you know, just be, you know, passionately yelling into the microphone with a ton of energy and jumping up and down. <laughs> there was this hype to everything. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things we saw as we transitioned into Gen Z is that Gen Z, they grew up with a lot less optimism about the world. Hmm. I mean, they're uh, people say that about, about millennials now, too. But yeah, they think yeah. millennials have a bad Gen Z. <laughs> they've, they've never known a time that we haven't been, you know, in some state of war. I mean, you know, 9 11 isn't really a, a memory in their mind of a time before this. Mm. Um, the stories that they grew up with, very dystopian, whether it be, you know, Hunger Games or Divergent mm -hmm. uh, or Maze Runner, go down the line, yeah. where the, the hero doesn't always prevail. And there's this um, sense of social anxiety mm -hmm. that I want to find safety in my people. Mm -hmm. um, there's more of a, of a chill, um, nature rather than the, this height nature uh -huh. um, to where you know these big events um you know flashy bringing the band um you know that creates almost this stress for a yeah. lot of Gen Z. and of course these are broad strokes um, right. you know individuals vary um but there's much more of a desire for connection into a smaller group and so these small group ministries that were so important for millennials but often undervalued by millennials have become really the life source for Gen Z of uh, these are my people, this is my community, mm. and I want a few close-knit friends rather than 
the you know smoke and light in crowd of thousands mm. and so it's really changed um, a lot of how we I almost see uh, a cycle to that too, though. How we promote. as you're saying this 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 is i hadn't even thought of it this way before but there used to be so like you know before millennials um which which one was before millennials is that the so millennials are gen y so gen, gen x y. so be gen x and before a. that is the boomers right exactly yeah okay i knew there was another generation between the boomers and millennials yeah but going far enough all, back all the forgotten generation so we'll, right uh, <laughs> lived it out right here <laughs> but uh there used to be a very strong sense of community like the people who came through like the depression um and things like that there's a huge tight-knit local sense of community and there was also kind of a sense of grit and determination we'll push through these hard things you know by the skin of our teeth kind of idea and then the millennials were kind of like rebelling against like well i want to be my own way you know i want to do you know, very individualist in many ways but it's almost like like gen z is like coming back returning back to a sense of community that's something I'm, I'm passionate about personally is community, how important and powerful that is. And it's one of the things that I, I get frustrated with is like the individualism that we have nowadays. Um, it's too much of an emphasis on that. And seeing that, you know, the, the, I think there's an awareness that we can learn from the Gen Z of returning back to that sense of let's connect um, to each other and develop meaningful relationships. That's actually really cool. Absolutely. I think as people, we have these um, innate desires to um, connect. Mm -hmm. um, Genesis 1 talks about how we are created in the image of God. And one of the things we see in the image of God, this picture of um, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that God yeah. in God's self is relationship and is relational. Yeah. And we similarly were created to connect and created with this capacity for a relationship. And the first thing and that God so, said that wasn't good was that man was alone. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. And so one of the things as I step into um, my new role as an executive pastor over youth ministry mm -hmm. um, at Hope Lutheran Church is um, it's over cradle through college for their three campuses, um, over a thousand students, all of those teams. So it's not really that I'm the, you know, the face connecting with these individuals or that, you know, I'm the main relationship, you know, not, not in any way. Mm -hmm. We're really thinking through um, what is this arc? What is this journey that we're taking students on to become um, relationally connected um, with God and with others? Yeah. And so, you know, as you start really at these, you know, this earliest age, you know, with the, you know, you think of toddlers, right? Or hope they call them the hope tots. <laughs> uh, and you have be loved. Um, first John 419, we love because God first loved us. I mean, there's not really much else that a toddler can do to contribute, you know, to connection and all this other than just <laughs> be a recipient of love, right? Be love. Right. right. And then as you get on to, um, you know, elementary, you know, even, you know, some pre-K, but, you know, really from this kind of like three to, uh, three to 11 window, um, there's this idea of um, belong. And so from be loved to belong and, uh, you know, Jesus talks about in, in Matthew 19, 14, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these children um, are developing their social skills, their capacity for relationship with God and with others. And so we move from belong to be loved. And then as we get into middle school and at Hope, from Hope Kids to Hope Tots, or from Tots to Kids, and they go into their middle school ministry, there's this idea of belief. Mm. And so we want to start. Um, That's when they start asking those questions, questions that you're talking yeah, about. Of identity, of vocation. Yeah. You know, who am I and where do I fit in this world? And how does God fit into this picture? Mm -hmm. um, and so how from. Fit into God's love, picture. <laughs> yeah. To belong to believe. Um, Romans 10 9 says, if we declare with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. There's this idea that. Um, that we have been born into um, this broken and sinful world, mm -hmm. um, but that through Jesus, God wants to lift us um, out of our sin and into our calling. And so um, we find this arc from be loved to belong, to believe. And then finally, as they get into high school ministry, 
this idea of be light. And so we're not called just to connect into relationships with God and with others, you know, for our own right. um, fulfillment, for our own um, wholeness and nourishing, um, but to um, be members of society, members of community um, that build around us, that add value, that contribute, um, yeah. that bring light into this world, um, that we're really called to be um, change makers and light bearers. And so that's kind of the arc um, mm -hmm. there. And, you know, if you look at, you know, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others that they might see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Um, so, you know, kind of my new roles and thinking about this, how do we help mm -hmm. you know, Gen Z as they finish this arc, Gen Alpha, you know, as they're in the middle of this and eventually yeah. Gen Beta, right? <laughs> um, move from this place, um, you know, of, you know, be loved, to belong, to believe, to be light, to be fully formed, connected humans yeah. um, in this world that God's created for them. Yeah. And th those transition stages are so challenging. Uh, and, you know, I was thinking back, you know, my earlier, my earlier comments about, you know, my own experience of, you know, not having like intramural sports as an example of where there's like this age segregation that's happening where they're kind of layered out like that. Um, but in today's digital world, we have people interacting all up and down the, the, uh, the hierarchy of generations in a sense, all over the place. And you can target it, right? Specific thing to so people. And of course, YouTube tries this thing, you know, YouTube for kids, which it's really annoying when someone's like, yes, this is made for kids. Like, no, it's not. And I can't put it in a playlist now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's, you try and segregate these things out, but the internet is just out there and open for everybody. And so there's all these different things where people are transforming how they interact with things based on their generations, but they're all still interacting with everything. And so it kind of like on one hand mixes everything together, but also segregates again somehow. And yeah. th there's different ways that people interact with technology at these different stages. So what are some things that you, you discovered in your research about you know, the relationship of these different generations to technology and how that's impacted those gaps? Yeah, well, I think that one of the things about personal devices, you know, I've got, got my smartphone yeah, here, yeah. is that they're personal. In many ways, these, these screens aren't share you know 50 years ago families passed around the same newspaper they watched <laughs> the same shows on a shared television screen they had different preferences but they had the same experiences right now today people enter the digital world largely alone on separate devices mm -hmm. they read completely different and often contradictory news sources they consume digital content and culture separately and so when the family sits around the dinner table and tries to talk about their digital experiences they don't know where to start. Yeah. And so I think one of the big challenges that we have, um, especially as, um, you know, we think about these generations of digital natives is how do we engage um, in the experiences of others, um, actively listen, ask good questions, mm -hmm. and really show an interest um, in um, things for which we're gonna start with very little shared context. You know, I'm not big on social media. I don't uh, have a TikTok, but a lot of our students are on TikTok. <laughs> so um, I've got three interns right now, and they said, we want to start a TikTok um, for the student ministry. And I said, well, you know, I, I don't know much about it, but of course, you know, run with it. Um, let's see what happens. So they, they put out a TikTok, and it got literally thousands of views in the first day and over 600 likes. And that's not anywhere near the engagement numbers that we would have gotten um, on a Facebook or Twitter um, or what have you. Right. So, you know, even though I may not have personal experience with TikTok, I might not, you know, be on this platform or understand much about it. Um, you know, entering to that conversation, saying yes, saying, yeah, explain it to me, walk me through this. Um, you know, teach me what you're experiencing, mm -hmm. um, I think is probably one of the biggest pieces for staying relevant and staying connected mm -hmm. into other generations. Um, we need to listen, we need to engage, 
and uh, not just say, well, hey, that's not the way that I've done things. <laughs> it's almost like if each of us are looking through windows into different parts of the internet in a sense like that, we have the task of becoming bridges. So like going back to, you know, sitting around the table, you know, one person may be interested in TikTok, one on Twitter, you know, one on Facebook and so on, or one on Reddit. And they're sitting around together. They, they don't have, see into each other's worlds, but they see each other and they're shaped by those communities. And so the family needs to be a circle of community that intersects with all those other communities that adds a sense of grounding and contextualization uh, for it. Like when you look at, you know, looking at, you know, the biblical examples of how the church is engaged with the Bible for its history, for the most of the life of Christendom, <laughs> Uh, it's always been communally, you know, everybody came together to hear the word in church, right? Because, you know, people didn't have their own personal copies of scripture. That wasn't a thing until way, way later. <laughs> and so then everybody had their own copies of scripture and they started, and it started almost diffracting away from the, the contextualization of reading scripture together in church. And in a similar way, we need to bring back this sense of uh, the family and these in the church and these communities as um, a locus of identity and meaning that gives meaning to the way that each person interacts with the social digital worlds, right? So one person may say, hey, I saw this thing on Reddit and bring it up and introduce it to the rest of the family. And they go, oh, I saw this thing over on Facebook that's similar and bring it back together and connect on that and explore it within that familial context as a way to kind of create those bridges um, between these different sectors. Yeah, I think that's really interesting as you talk about the communal reading of scripture, because, you know, if you and I might talk about, you know, what we have been reading devotionally in the scriptures, you know, this last week, they're probably going to be different texts, mm -hmm. just realistically. Um, unless you're Eastern Orthodox. So we all read yeah. at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, again, these ancient traditions. Yep. Um, but as we get into, you know, more, um, you know, these more modern approaches, you know, I might be reading from, um, you know, Ezekiel, while you're reading from Acts, I mean, we could be on completely different pages. Yeah. We have a shared faith um, yeah. in, you know, in, in the, in the Christian tradition and the creeds and all these things that we share. And yet um, we might be in very different places mm -hmm. <laughs> in the liturgical calendar or these sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I see this hyper-personalization happening, you know, especially to talk about personal devices um, you know, and this started, you know, with books and the fact that we could right. be on different pages in the same book. Well, now yeah. it's not, you know, just, you know, we don't even have the same book anymore, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> we don't even have the same medium anymore. Exactly. You know? We're all on different platforms, not, you know, not just one's audio book, one's visual graphic yeah. novel. <laughs> so, um, this book, Gen Alpha, uh, one of the things it talks about is that one of the things that's going to set Gen Alpha apart from Gen Z is this intense personalization. And so children's books these days, um, they can be ordered with your kid's name. And so instead of, you know, right. C run, we all know who Scott is, you know, it's C Cade run, you know? Oh, wow. Um, that you can actually get it, you know, everything tailored really directly to you in a very personal way and printed for you. And there's a sense that we don't even maybe have shared characters of the same story wow. uh, because they can be personalized at such a deep level. And of course that sells and there's the marketing aspect and it makes us mm -hmm. feel um, seen and heard and known. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, not all of this has to be painted as, as good or bad, but right. certainly it creates. How do we interact with it though? Yeah. It creates unique challenges and opportunities when it comes to connecting with each other. Yeah. That's really fascinating. I, I, that's one thing that, you know, I've kind of been excited about as, um, uh, industrialization has progressed to the point where you can get back into customization again, where in the old days, if you wanted clothes, they were made for you, mm -hmm. right? You go to a tailor and he measure you and he make clothes for you. You go, you want shoes, you go to a cobbler, he makes shoes for you. Like he keeps the form of your foot, right? And so everything was made for you and it was made to last, right? But then as you went into industrialization, everything was just mass manufactured we just kind of got used to getting clothes off the rack that eh, it kind of for fits. <laughs> and then if you were, it was a luxury to tailor it to fit you as opposed to being something that was ordinary. But now where you can, you know, take a picture of yourself and the computer can measure yourself and then adjust the machines to custom 
you know, cut the clothes and sell them specifically to you, you can actually get tailored clothes again for, you know, affordable price. It's not a luxury anymore. But, and so there's a retend trend back towards personalization. Mm -hmm. But then with the lack of relationship that's there, like before you knew your tailor, you knew Mm -hmm. your cobbler, and now it's a computer. Right. So there's a less of a uh, relationship dynamic to the personalization. But then if you're personalizing a book to you personally, that could create like your parents go and get you a book customized, tailored to you. That could build a relationship between you and your parents because Mm -hmm. it brings out life into that relationship. And then the technology is serving that relationship instead of standing in the way of it. Mm -hmm. Right. So looking at these things as how can we bring relationships back into the personalization and to reconnect people through these kinds of technologies is really cool, actually. Yeah, I think, um, and, you know, Gen Z is really the, the customizing generation, you know, where you can, can pick <laughs> from 10 choices and then right. Gen Alpha is the personalizing generation where you don't need to pick from 10 choices. You just, you know, spell it exactly what you want. <laughs> that, that one of a kind piece. Yeah. Uh, but I think a lot of these things, um, they don't have to, as you know, and, and you alluded to this, they don't have to hinder yeah. um, connection. In fact, in many ways they can help because when you have a personalized piece and then you share that with someone else, say, hey, this is why I chose what I chose. And mm-hmm. um, you can share a lot of yourself and your personality more so than, hey, I got those sneakers too, which can build connection right. because yeah. you know, there's, there's a shared experience, but even these different experiences um, can become conversation starters that can breed connection. Yeah, absolutely. In the ministry world, especially in large churches, where uh, most of my time as a pastor has been in, in larger churches. So um, Hope had, I think, 11,600 people over Holy Week. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's bigger than you can know everyone, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Humanly impossible. Exactly. We talk about. I think our cap for meaningful relationships is 180 ish, depending or 150, depending on the study. Yeah, actually, uh, <laughs> it's interesting that you bring that up because there's this glass ceiling in in ministries where they say if um, if you break 150, then the space no longer feels like a community because you're not going to um, recognize all the faces. Right. Right. Yeah. And so that's usually a restructuring point um, in student ministry is if you're getting around 150, you're not actually going to grow anymore. <laughs> Until you've split it off into, you know, multiple structures, multiple campuses, you know, splitting off grades in different ways. And then you build back up to these, this 150 glass ceiling. Um, I wonder if that's going to, uh, there's a similar application online with the max of 49 people on a Zoom window at a time. Mm -hmm. And if you could like, if there's a, and people are going to start looking and seeing uh, community dynamics get related back to the magic number of 49 because of yeah. the technical limitation, how many people you can fit on a screen at once. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we see that model, you know, in Jesus where he has, you know, his, his three closest disciples, but he's yeah. got the 12 and then 72 and then the 120. So there's this idea that, yeah. and then you have the crowds. Right. And Everybody. The structure differently. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we talk about, uh, you know, in large churches, the, the, the circles and the rows. Mm-hmm. So the rows are what create these shared experiences. And so that's, you know, often the, the Sunday or Wednesday service, um, or, you know, you have your Saturday night services with Vespers as well. And um, this idea that we're coming into this shared experience in, um, you know, essentially, um, you know, we use the analogy of rows. It wouldn't have to be rows specifically, but this is the people you sit next to in a pew kind of idea. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so or we all want to an Orthodox that. church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're standing for right. <laughs> on Saturday, standing for you know over three hours, and it was, it was glorious. Yes, <laughs> but my feet uh, reminded me the next day of what I did. <laughs> it, 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 it's it's a part of our aesthetic discipline, I suppose. <laughs> exactly. Um, this ex- this shared experience that we can all talk about. Mm-hmm. So you might have you know a thousand people go into this space. And in rows, they experience the same thing. And then anyone you talk to of these thousand people, you know, can say, hey, you know, what'd you get out of that message? Hey, you know, what'd you think of this? Right. Uh, this they had a shared experience. We, yeah, we have these shared experiences. But then at the next level is that we have to move into circles. Ministry is not effective just in rows. It's not programs that disciple people. It's people that disciple people. Yes. 
And so moving into these circles, um, and that's Jesus 12, these small group experiences where we can know and be known. Because in the rows, um, there's really no mechanism for the, the presenter to know us or for us to really know them, interact, ask questions. And so we can like, you don't start a networking conversation with the person next to you in your pew very, or at least not a very effective one. Yeah, exactly. It's at the potluck afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> and that's this, you know, shared experience versus sharing our personal experience. It's not that one is, is good and one is bad, but that they provide unique challenges and unique opportunities for connection. Yeah, I love that. Which, which goes into also something that we were bringing up in our, in our pre-show about when you're look, dealing with large teams and you have this scaled structure so you can relate more, you know, have more connection and, and, and connection in different ways at different scales. And then of course, also we see that online as well. You have one-on-one -on -one direct messages and you have, you know, small group chats or, you know, you know, particular channel on a discord server or whatever. And then you've got, you know, blasting out to Twitter for the entire world to see <laughs> uh, all these different stages of similar kind of um, structure. But we also see the diversity of perspectives that come into play at these different levels too. And going back to the generations, um, we often look for diversity in terms of, you know, race or gender or ideology and the different, different perspectives on that side, uh, which, is, which is important. Uh, but also these different experiences of generations and different ages, being able to provide opportunities for older people to learn from younger people and younger people to learn from older people is really important. And you even look inside um, for like in hybrid organizations, right? People who are on site, people who are remote, you need, they need to be able to learn from each other. Like, what can we learn from working? I just did a recent episode uh, with Kel Delaney about how facilitation is different in person versus online and how they can learn from each other. And you can take pieces from this and use it here and pieces from that and use it there. So what are some ways that we can bridge these kinds of diverse gaps and be more intentional in listening and engage um, these, instead of bringing them together and having them fight with each other, <laughs> how do we bring them together and learn from each other? I think one starting point is that we need to truly believe that we are made for relationship. Hmm. And that, that sounds like a, you know, a throwaway sentence, you know, overly simplistic. No, it's powerful. We live in such a fast-paced society um, where because we're constantly connected to our work and our home and everything through these devices, um, our to-do list is always just a, just a touch away. Mm. Um, and, you know, notifications, you know, flood and reminding us of all these things that we need to do. You know, there's no surprise that anxiety, you know, is spiking, stress is spiking and stress disorders and all of these things we need to remind ourselves and truly believe that we were made and are made for relationship. Yeah. We need to set aside our to-do list and say that, hey, the, the top priority is to be a whole human connected with other humans. Mm -hmm. And I, I think when we start there, Mm -hmm. then we can reclaim some of these things. And a lot of uh, the, the global South, um, you know, whether, you know, you're in, in Kenya or in, in Brazil, they all, uh, a lot of these cultures that are very warm have these jokes um, of, you know, how are your chickens? <laughs> okay. And, you know, and, and the, the point of this, and I've heard the same story from, from people of different backgrounds, but how are your chickens? This idea of, you know, you, you pass someone on the street and so you say, well, how are you? And, you know, uh -huh. they, they answer and ask you, and then, you know, how, um, you know, how is your family and how is your mother and how is your father and how are your children? Uh -huh. And, you know, and eventually it just gets down to this point. You say, how are your, how are your goats? You know, how are your chickens? And <laughs> you get, get all the way down, you know, into just asking, uh, you know, give me this the information of your life right now. <laughs> I passed you on the street. <laughs> and so uh, in a lot of these cultures, um, and as I've had opportunity to, um, to spend some time um, 
in, um, in uh, Uganda or Honduras on mission, this sort of thing. They um, talk about, you know, um, African time or Honduran time and all of these phrases um, where it's like, you know, things will start around this time. People might arrive late, might arrive early because you don't know how many people you passed along the way. And I think, wow, I'm so attached to my clock that if I've got a meeting at 10 and it's on the other side of, of the building, again, in a larger church, you know, you pass by people to get to the meeting, you know, well, I might, I might leave, you know, you know, with five minutes to do the one minute walk, but I'm not going to be late to the meeting because I passed someone and I'm asking about their chickens. <laughs> um, there's this idea that tasks are somehow a higher priority than relationships. And I think that we need not to neglect our tasks or neglect our schedules, um, but to find ways and carve out ways to make relationships the most important thing about who we are and what we do. Yeah, I love that answer. That is really powerful. Being able to not, because so, so, we, we see that same pattern of interruptions, right? And in our society where, but they're all about task notifications that are interrupting us. We're reading a book or talking to somebody and something pings up on our phone. Oh, I got to check that and checking our, you know, our text messages and all this kind of stuff. And we're, instead of going on the way to a task and being interrupted by people and prioritizing that, we are talking with people and being interrupted by all the tasks and prioritizing that. It's a complete inversion. And that's really sad, I think. I think it's, I think it's really important, like you said, to carve out ways um, for taking control of those notifications and like sequestering them away. It's like, okay, now's the time I'm gonna go check out what my updates are and dedicate this time block to that. And other than the time I'm free and open to focus and be present and connect with the person right in front of me. That's really important. I love that. Cause then we are, so you have the opportunity to learn. Yeah, it changes the way we interact because I might not have an interest in TikTok, which I, I don't. I don't have an interest in downloading TikTok, <laughs> watching TikToks. Right. <laughs> but I do have an interest in, you know, my intern's experience on TikTok because it's part of their life. And not just professionally of, oh, they made one for our student ministry and it, you know, um, had these amazing statistics. Mm -hmm. But, hey, they watched this funny thing and now they have this inside joke between them. You know, tell me about it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this one... Uh, where this, this guy, he um, catches a fish. He's on the front of a boat mm -hmm. and he, he holds out his phone for a picture and it's catch and release. You know, you, yeah. you grab the fish, you toss it back in the lake. Yeah. So he, you know, he takes the, the picture, right? Mm -hmm. And then he tosses the phone, the phone in the oh, lake. No. <laughs> you know, this look of shock on his face when he realized that he kept the fish <laughs> and threw the phone. No. And, uh, so yeah, so they're all laughing about it. So they share that with me and I get to be a part of their experience. Yeah. You know, so I'm not, I'm not going through TikTok and finding these gems right. myself, right. but I have an interest in them. Right. And so I have an interest in what interests them. Yes. And then what I find out is even though I, you know, don't care about TikTok at all. Mm -hmm. um, hey, that actually was really funny. <laughs> it's, it still supported your relationship. <laughs> uh, and now you know i just you know we just have this <laughs> yep. this, this point of connection this inside <laughs> of, um, the shared experience um that didn't start as shared um but you know they they let me enter into their world mm -hmm. i love that and i think in so many ways uh which circles back to what we were talking about earlier about um being bridges you know being those windows when we're so separated and so individualized, so customized and personalized in our experiences of the digital world, um, to make that intentional prioritized effort to connect with each other and be the bridges between all those separate pieces uh, so that we can retain that sense of community, which is so important. I love that. Well, this has been a really awesome conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to share some of your experiences and uh, your thoughts on this. This is really cool. Thank you. Glad to be on it. All right, fantastic. I look forward to uh, having you back probably at some point. I'm sure we'll have plenty more to talk about. <laughs> uh, but thank you, Stephen, again. Um, and I will see you in the next uh, time that we meet.
around Fargo somewhere. <laughs> we'll run into this soon, I'm sure. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Thank you again. Thanks, James. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you had your curiosity sparked to explore these subjects with greater awareness or gained a valuable insight along the way. Take a look at the show notes for links to where you can find Stephen, leave reviews wherever you can, and make sure to join the conversation on my Discord. Remember, community is the catalyst that drives lasting transformation. I'll see you in the next episode of Catalytic Curiosity.